Hello, I'm continuing my reviews on the Friday the 13th series with Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning. Now, this came out in 1985, and this, of course, is the fifth film in the Friday the 13th franchise. Now, I already reviewed this, along with all the other Friday the 13th films, all the way back in 2011 for Season 1 of Horror Month. Those reviews are still up, however, they're no longer public. They're now marked as unlisted, but you can still see them on the Horror Month Season 1 playlist, which I will leave a link to in the description below. And I recently did new reviews on the first four Friday the 13th movies, which you can see on the playlist for Horror Month Season 13. Now, Friday the 13th Part 5 was co-written and directed by Danny Steinman, who prior to this directed a hardcore porno film called High Rise. He also did a few other horror films like The Unseen and Savage Streets. And I think this ended up being his last movie, and unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He died back in 2012. So, this is coming right off the heels of Friday the 13th, The Final Chapter, which was meant to be the final film in the franchise, but then Paramount realized that they liked money, so they decided to continue on. But this is a unique one where it simultaneously acts as a direct sequel to Final Chapter, as well as a soft reboot of the franchise, because this was an attempt to take the series in a new direction, hence the title, A New Beginning. Now, the fact that the Friday the 13th movies that followed this would not go in the direction that this one sets up and would more or less ignore this one should tell you that this movie did kind of fail, at least as far as the fans were concerned at the time, although in recent years, fans have kind of warmed up to this one. Now, I'm going to say right up front that I do like this one a lot, although as I've gotten older, I've noticed the film certainly does have its problems, but I still think it's a unique entry in the series. Now, what the plot of Friday the 13th Part 5 is it's set maybe five years after the events of the final chapter, meaning that this one is technically in the future, because assuming final chapter was set in 84, which is the year it came out, that would set this one in 1989 or possibly 1990. And as I pointed out in my review of Friday the 13th Part 2, timeline does become a major question as these movies go on in terms of when exactly these movies are supposed to be taking place. But in the movie, we follow Tommy Jarvis, who was one of the main characters of the final chapter, who was only a 12-year-old boy in that movie, and was the one who ended up killing Jason in the end. In this movie, he's 17, possibly 18 years old, and he's suffering from severe PTSD after what happened to him in the previous film. Like, he's being plagued by nightmares and hallucinations about Jason, and he's spent a few years at a psychiatric hospital, but now he's sent away to a halfway house. But what happens is, towards the beginning of the film, one of the patients at the halfway house, a man named Vic, goes ballistic on this kid named Joey and violently murders him. Vic is quickly arrested, but... Shortly after that, a series of murders begin happening, both at and around the halfway house. Is it a new killer, or has Jason's evil somehow been reborn? That's the basic plot of the movie. Now, massive spoiler for this movie, but Jason is not the killer in this one, which at the time was a major point of contention for fans, making this almost the Halloween 3 of the Friday the 13th franchise. The thing is, though, it really shouldn't have come as that much of a surprise that Jason wasn't going to be the killer this time around, because we saw Jason pretty definitively die at the end of the previous film. And keep in mind, this is before they officially established Jason as a supernatural being. Yes, the first four films had subtle elements of the supernatural, but for the most part, they tried to be reality-based, and we were supposed to assume that Jason was a human in those earlier Friday the 13th sequels. And Jason was supposed to be definitively dead at this point. Now, of course, they would retcon that and make Jason more of 
of a supernatural being. But again, this is before they decided to take the series in that direction. Now, the film stars John Shepard as Tommy Jarvis, and he actually does a really good job in this movie. He actually gives almost a better performance than the movie itself actually deserves. And one of the reasons I do defend this movie is when it focuses on Tommy, it actually tries to be kind of a psychological character study on this young man suffering from severe PTSD. And in a way, the film tries to tackle what would be the realistic ramifications of surviving a slasher movie scenario. And John Shepard apparently volunteered at a psychiatric hospital to prepare for the role. But here's the thing, he didn't even know he was going to be in a Friday the 13th movie because I think when he signed on for this film, it was under a different title and that was by design because a lot of actors did not want to be in these movies and were kind of duped into being in these films because these movies did not have a very good reputation at the time and apparently Shepard was royally pissed when he found out that he was going to be in a Friday the 13th movie. He was like, I did all that fucking work for a fucking Friday the 13th movie. But as somebody who always appreciates it when horror tries to be a cut above and tries to have a little bit of character drama in it, I really appreciated John Shepard's performance regardless of whether he wanted to be there or not. But I will say John Shepard's really serious performance doesn't always mesh well with the film's goofier and campier elements, and dear god, there is a lot of goofy shit in this movie. And Corey Feldman actually does reprise his role as the young Tommy Jarvis in a dream sequence at the beginning of the film, and that sequence was apparently shot in Corey Feldman's backyard. Now, apparently they wanted Corey Feldman to be in the movie more, but at the time he was shooting The Goonies. The movie also stars Melody Kidman as Pam, who is one of the guidance counselors at the halfway house, and she essentially becomes our final girl in the movie, even though Tommy is clearly the central protagonist. The movie also features Shavar Ross, who people might recognize from Different Strokes and Family Matters as Reggie, and I'll admit, growing up, I always found Reggie to be kind of annoying, but you know what? This character has grown on me, and I can honestly say that I like Reggie the Reckless. And the movie does hint at a friendship developing between him and Tommy that I wish the movie would have explored a lot more. Unfortunately, besides them, most of the other characters in the movie are kind of forgettable, although that redneck mother and son are pretty freaking hilarious. You also have Miguel Nunez Jr., who people might recognize from Return of the Living Dead and Leprechaun 4 as Demon, Reggie's older brother, and he has this hilarious scene in the movie where he's in an outhouse and he's just singing to his girlfriend... Ooh, baby. Hey, baby. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I crack up every time I see that scene. I want to point out that there's a character in this movie named Tina who is played by an actress named Debbie Sue Voorhees, and I'm not joking, that's actually her last name. Now, she has a pretty gratuitous nude scene in the film, which I'm not complaining about at all, but that scene would end up getting the actress in trouble years later because she would end up quitting acting and becoming a teacher, and they ended up firing her because of her scene in this film, which I think is so fucked up. The movie also features Dick Wyand, if I'm saying his last name right, as a paramedic named Roy Burns, who, spoiler, ends up being the antagonist of the film. It turns out he's the father of the boy Joey, who we see get murdered towards the beginning of the film. The idea is that after Joey died, his mind snapped, and he ended up taking on the persona of Jason. It doesn't really explain why Jason... I mean, I guess... 
get it. It's a Friday the 13th movie, but, like, in the universe, it doesn't really explain, like, why is he obsessed with Jason? Does he have some kind of connection to Jason? Does he know that a survivor of Jason's massacre is at the halfway house? It seems like he does know about Tommy, because he does end up putting the bodies of his victims in Tommy's room at one point. Now, in the movie, when Roy is dressed up as Jason, he's actually played by Tom Morga, who also played Jason in The Hallucinations. However, in the film's opening dream sequence, Jason is played by John Hawk. Now, this movie was heavily censored by the MPAA, but some of the violence, and I might be committing horror fan sacrilege here, but some of the violence I'm actually glad was kind of toned down. For example, there's a character in the movie named Violet, who we see get stabbed in the stomach by Roy at one point, but originally Roy was supposed to stab her in the vagina. And you know what? I'm glad that scene wasn't in there. That would have just been too fucking exploitive and too sleazy, even for my taste. And maybe I'm a hypocrite, because I do like movies like The Last House of the Left, or Cannibal Holocaust, or Irreversible, but at least in those movies, you could argue that the sexual violence against women is somewhat part of the story, especially with a movie like Irreversible, and arguably you know what you're getting when you go into movies like that, where something like a Friday the 13th movie, I'm sorry, something like that is completely unneeded. It's the same thing with the original Evil Dead, and I love the original Evil Dead, but honestly, the one scene in that movie I could do without is the tree raping scene. But yeah, I like Friday the 13th Part 5 New Beginning. It's not a perfect movie by any means, but I do enjoy this one. And again, I feel John Shepard's performance at least elevates this a little bit. Now, I actually got to see this movie in the theaters back in 2019. It was at the Cinema Arts Center, which is a theater here on Long Island where I live, and I remember the audience had a freaking blast with this movie. Now, the movie ends with Tommy Jarvis in the hospital, and we see him put on the hockey mask, implying that his mind has completely snapped at this point, and setting him up as the killer for the rest of the franchise. But of course the films that came right after this would completely ignore this ending. Now, I don't believe this movie was a flop, but fans were thoroughly disappointed with the direction that this movie tried to take. So, right after this, you had Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, which officially brought Jason back. In that movie, they dropped all pretenses at realism, and Jason came back as an outright zombie in that movie. Now, Tommy Jarvis was the main character of Part 6, where he was played by Tom Matthews, but honestly, Tom Matthews' version of Tommy is almost a completely different character from John Shepard's version of Tommy Jarvis. Which has led some fans to believe that Part 6 is ignoring the events of Part 5, but they do kind of reference the events of this movie in that one, but they do completely disregard the ending of 5. But a way I think you could kind of get around it and still assume that the final shot of the movie is canon is perhaps that was just another dream sequence, or perhaps Pam was able to get through to Tommy before he could kill her, Apparently that actually is addressed in the novelization of Friday the 13th Part 6. Now, Debbie Sue Voorhees, who I mentioned before, she actually would go on to direct a 2021 film called 13 Fanboy. I haven't seen that movie yet, but apparently it's about an obsessed Friday the 13th fan, and a lot of the same people who were in the Friday the 13th movies play themselves in that movie. Now, it seems like the most recent Halloween film, Halloween Ends, might actually owe something to this movie in terms of some of the directions that that movie takes. Now, before I end this video, I want to cut to a clip of my late friend Chris Mano giving his thoughts on Friday the 13th Part 5. Now, this was taken from a retrospective on this franchise that we did back in 2018. Now, this is the one that everybody gives shit to, but... I will say that I like it because it, it almost has like a slash of 
uh, no, uh, psychological thriller subplot to it. Um, it's about like Tommy's psychological state after everything that happened in part four and him kind of trying to figure out whether or not he's going to overcome it or just sort of give into it. And given the ending, you'd think that obviously he'd give into it, but that's what makes part six so significant is that he ends up being the hero of the franchise, oddly. So I think this one deserves credit for that. Uh, on top of that, this one actually had some good characters too, um, especially the little kid. He was really great, and kind of watching him, you really hope he's going to make it through because it'd be fucked up to watch him die. Um, so yeah, I do like this one. Here are my friend John's thoughts on Friday the 13th Part 5. Here's my comment on A New Beginning. As I said before, we don't fall for when they claim the last movie, and despite liking Friday the 13th, the final chapter, this one is the opposite for me. This one I'm not too crazy about. The actor who played Tommy in this movie was so bland and forgetful. He takes a backseat in this movie. He's not the main focus like I thought he was going to be. One would think after the way the last movie ended that Tommy would be the main focus of this movie. If Tommy was the main focus in this movie, I would have liked to see him in therapy where he works with a psychiatrist who is analyzing him and he tries to help Tommy overcome his fear as best as possible. Seeing how Tommy has PTSD from that traumatic experience when he killed Jason has really haunted him. The parts when he hallucinates, thinking that Jason is there, but he's not, and that it's all in his head. I miss Corey Feldman as Tommy Jarvis, but around this time, Corey Feldman was filming The Goonies around the same time as this movie was being made. He only has one scene at the beginning in a dream sequence. This is where the movie fails, too many side minor characters that are not that important to the story. The characters are bland, lame, cliche. At least in the last movie, the characters had personality and were semi-likable to a certain degree. None of these characters are memorable. There are no characters to relate to in this movie. It has too many subplots that don't add up or not that too important to the story. Like, for instance, when the guy who stutter confesses he wants to make love to a girl he likes, then she laughs at him doesn't take him seriously. Like the guy in Airplane said, what a pisser. Side note, when I was re-watching this movie, being a fan of Turner Classic Movies, I noticed they were watching A Place in the Sun with Montgomery Cliff and Elizabeth Taylor. That's a really good movie. And I wish I was talking about that movie instead of this movie. Also, that girl who constantly listens to music on her headphones and does a robot dance, again, not important to the story. The characters Ethel and her son were annoying, over-the-top, stupid, and ridiculous. Ethel's son was a big man babe who had a lot of issues and really needed serious professional help. This movie tried too hard not knowing they wanted to make this into a dark comedy. It was kind of funny when Demon, played by Miguel A. Nunez, after eating some bad enchiladas, he had to take a huge massive shit, then Jason kills him. Don't eat bad food in a horror movie that makes you have to take a huge shit. <laughs> When that character Joey offers chocolate bars, he doesn't take a hint. He gets axed by a guy who has anger management issues over a stupid candy bar. One of the few kills on a Friday movie sequel, not done by Jason. Tina's played by Debbie Sue Voorhees. She's probably one of the few Friday actors whose last name is Voorhees. This must be a rare thing for a horror movie. I'm not gonna lie, she was hot. Another one of my favorite Friday girls who's not a final girl. Her sex scene was very exploited, out of all the sex scenes in a Friday movie. Danny Steinman, the director of this movie, was a porn director before directing Hollywood movies. He was originally supposed to be signed on to direct the next Friday the 13th movie, but he got into a motorcycle accident and was unable to direct the next Friday the 13th movie. This movie has 20 kills. This makes it the largest body kill count in the Friday the 13th series. Also, once again, well, you don't see the kills, special effects, thanks to the MPAA, to too many jump cuts on the kills. But again, you can watch the deleted scenes on the Blu-rays of this movie. The bell kill is the only one you see. Sorry for my spoiler right here. I'll what was the point of calling this movie Friday the 13th if Jason was not the killer? If some random guy was impersonating Jason just because his son was killed over a stupid chocolate bar? This sounds like something a fourth grader wrote. This part was so stupid and dumb. This felt like the version of Halloween 3 where no Jason was not in this movie because he was dead. Some guy impersonated him. I once met Melanie Keenan back in 2013 at Chiller Theater. She was very nice. She told me she was offered to come back for the next one, but said she did not like the script. 
A complete mess that had semi potential and interesting ideas, but sadly, this movie failed and was a disappointment. I know that some fans like this as a guilty pleasure for the funny, goofy, over the top, that's fine. Me, not so much. I can leave this movie behind. It can be a letdown and disappointment that Jason was not the killer for some fans. A movie I watch on rare occasions and forget about the characters, and then I move on after that. And here are Joey's thoughts on part five. Part five, I really think is good, was was another one of my favorite in the series. Corey Feldman was also in that one, too, at the beginning. And they had a lot of uh, good effects in that, too. It was supposed to be with Jason. Um, somebody, uh, this person was dressed up as Jason. There's people that said it wasn't one of their favorite, but, but there is a lot that say it was cool. You know, it is one of my favorite in the series, too, one of them. Like I said, the Friday the 13th movies, I really like all of them. Or five, I have to say, was another one of my favorites. I watched this a lot, too. And here is my friend Jeremy's short review of Friday the 13th, A New Beginning. Friday the 13th, Part 5, A New Beginning, is an alright sequel. It's not as good as Part 4, but it's entertaining enough. The plot concerns Tommy Jarvis moving into a halfway house for troubled teens and a new killer being on the loose. Spoiler alert, it's not Jason. Instead, it's Roy Burns, whose murdered son was one of the teens staying at the halfway house. This caused a lot of anger among Friday the 13th fans who thought that they were getting Jason again. Tom Morga plays the fake Jason and does a good job. I met Tom Morga a while back and he was very nice. And the characters are entertaining enough, especially this crazy woman named Ethel and her son Junior who live next door. For a lot of the movie, you don't see a full shot of the killer. You see his hands and his legs, but don't really get a full glimpse of him until the end. Danny Steinman is the director of this entry in the series, and I guess he does an alright job. I heard that he directed porn before he did this movie. Corey Feldman makes a brief cameo appearance at the beginning of the movie in a dream sequence, and it's nice to see him back again, even though it's brief. It's a shame that they couldn't get him to play Tommy for the whole movie, but he was busy filming The Goonies. All in all, this is a decently made entry in the series, although you might be disappointed that Jason's not the killer. I must say that I really enjoy the song playing during one of the death scenes called His Eyes. I think it really adds to the effectiveness of the scene. The kill scenes are pretty well done and effective. The one in which the guy gets his eyes crushed in was particularly brutal. So yeah, if you can forgive the fact that there's no Jason, you might like this entry in the series. So yeah, that was my review of Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning, and my next movie review will be on Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives.